Mason. Yes, I start sharing now? Yeah, thank you. And we'll, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Bronwyn. Um, Natural History Society of Maryland is definitely a great thing. You should all join because it's awesome. Uh, that is not what I meant to press. And there. Is that working all right? All right. Not yet. All I see is the black screen. It's oh, black screen? screen right now. It just says double click to enter full screen. It's not up? Hmm. That is. I think it's trying to still load. I don't think it's that you're not sharing your ah. screen. It's just loading yet. All right. There you go. There you go. All good. See intro to Maryland's fossils. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, this is just going to be a basic introduction to fossils uh, and also specifically to Maryland's fossils. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you people are in Maryland, um, but all this stuff will apply pretty much anywhere on Earth. Um, so I'm just going to get started right off here. Um, what is a fossil? A fossil is remains of life in the past. Um, although there's millions and millions and billions of beautiful uh, life forms living on Earth today, uh, there was even more in the past, um, and every age had a distinct ecosystem and beautiful dynamic life. Um, it comes from the Latin fossilis, just means obtained by digging. Uh, there's no real solid definition for how old a fossil is, but um, us people who study it uh, like to say 10,000 years, um, just because it's a nice line in the sand. Um, and the story of life is kind of intertwined with the story of uh, Earth as a whole. Um, the oldest widely accepted evidence of life is 3.5 billion years ago. Um, and the oldest possible reading of life, uh, which we find with uh, different chemistry uh, to see the molecules, is 4.2 billion years old. Um, and if we remember, life, uh, the Earth itself is only 4.5 billion years old. So um, life started out pretty quickly once the Earth formed. Um, and somehow it willed itself into existence. Um, and we have fossils from ever since then. Most fossils are younger than 540 million years, uh, years old. You don't have to remember all these numbers, by the way. Uh, they're just kind of so you can start thinking in that mindset of really deep time. Um, 540 million years ago, we have something called the Cambrian explosion, which is just where all these single cell life forms um, suddenly burst into thousands and thousands of uh, different species of multicellular life forms. Many of uh, those groups are still alive today. Um, next, oops. Uh, next, we ask how fossils form. Uh, so fossils, basically, something has to die, unfortunately. Um, so then it, this thing that is dead is either dead on land or dead in water. Um, has to fall to the bottom if it's in water. It needs to be rapidly buried, because if it's not rapidly buried, things will eat it. Um, and also, it'll start to decompose, you know, with mushrooms and fungus and other things, just like you'd see outside if something had died. Um, so something's buried up by dirt, mud, sand, whatever. And uh, then it's just going to sit there. But over time, it's going to rain and water is going to seep into that sediment. Um, it's going to slowly get buried deeper and deeper as new sediment flows on top. Um, and the minerals dissolved in that rainwater and in that groundwater are going to precipitate out. So imagine uh, if you've ever made like rock candy or something, you have sugar in the water, um, but as that water starts to evaporate when you boil it, the sugar's left behind. Well, the minerals in the groundwater or in the rainwater are gonna be left behind when the water goes away, and it's gonna act like a glue to kind of stick together all that sediment. Um, and over time, it's gonna get slowly smushed closer and closer and harder and harder um, because there's more stuff on top of it. Um, and then uh, geological forces are going to do something to it. Uh, either they couldn't do anything, either they don't do anything to it, and it's just left in its kind of um, unconsolidated uh, dirt or clay or sand shape, or it's going to be smushed even further into a stone. So like mud's going to turn into mudstone or shale. Sand is going to turn into sandstone. Uh, it's pretty straightforward in that regard. Nice naming job by the geologists. 
Um, and these geological forces are going to either bring them up to us in the case of marine fossils that we find on land uh, when the plate tectonics create mountains. Sometimes they bring up marine fossils for us to find, but sometimes they also can distort or even completely destroy them, um, which is why you won't find any fossils in uh, Carroll County, Maryland, or um, in, in Western Baltimore County, um, because all that stuff's been cooked or smushed away out of existence. Um, erosion is then gonna take away the layers of rock and, uh, and or sand, and it's gonna expose those fossils to us, um, which is great because we love finding fossils, but it also gives us only a short period of time before the fossils themselves um, dissipate. So that's why it's important for people like you and I and all the people here um, to go and collect these fossils before they're lost. There's several different types of fossils. Um, first is uh, your vanilla cast and molds. This is a sea lily. Um, let me get a pointer out. Uh, this is a sea lily, uh, which is sea lilies are still alive today. They're a lot less common than they used to be. Um, and they kind of look like flowers and they just kind of float in the ocean. Um, and this is the stalk of one. This is a mold of a fossil. So thing dies, gets buried, right? Um, gets the rock gets created when the thing gets smushed. And, but then the crinoid itself, the stalk is going to wear away, dissolve away, um, which leaves this void, which is in the perfect shape of the animal. Um, sometimes we have molds, which is the same thing, except it infills the middle of the thing. This is most common in like, uh, in like seashells, because they're, you know, they have a hollow space in the middle. Uh, so they're gonna be filled up, and then the shell itself is gonna wear away, but we have the perfect cast of the inside. Have the probably the prettiest is the permineralization. And this is just when something is covered up, but those same minerals that are gluing together the, the sediment to create rock are also going to uh, replace the fossil itself um, or the, the living thing into with minerals. Um, and sometimes we get these beautiful things that are replaced with silica, so they're, they're, uh, they shine like opal, because opal is also made of silica. Um, and all these different colors are due to uh, different impurities. Um, and one of the really cool things about permineralization, I know it's a big word, but it's really just, remember, water just leaving its, uh, its minerals behind. It preserves things so well that, like, if you took this, a slice of this tree right here, this is a tree uh, in front of, uh, from Arizona, from Petrified Woods State Park, uh, or not State Park, National Park. Um, it's at the Smithsonian. Um, if you took a slice of this really thin and put it under a microscope, you would see the individual cells that are still preserved after 300 million years, or not 300, but 200 million years of, uh, of sitting under the earth, which is crazy to me. Um, and then we have, over here we have a shark tooth. This is a megalodon tooth I found. Um, and it's also been permineralized. Another thing people don't talk about, scientists like to make it simple and just say, um, something is completely repla replaced by stone, but sometimes that's a little bit of a lie. Uh, for example, everything's kind of partially uh, replaced, except for things that are really old like this wood, um, but this tooth is only partially replaced with minerals. Um, so if you can take a sample of that tooth, you can put it in a big machine and it can uh, read the radioactive stuff in it, and we can learn cool things like what temperature did it form in and, uh, and stuff like that, which is super cool. Uh, that's called isotope reading, and it's becoming more common. It's pretty awesome. Then we have film fossils, uh, it, mineral film fossils. Um, this is a concretion from uh, Maison Creek, Illinois. Uh, they find them in these nice spheres, and you can split them open and there'll be fossils inside. Um, that can occur in other places as well. Um, but uh, we have these beautiful films of carbon. This carbon is the same stuff that made up the plant when it was alive. Uh, all life forms alive on Earth today are carbon-based. Um, so when it was smushed between these two layers, uh, it left its carbon film. This is the same plant, just positive and negative. And mineral films aren't always carbon. Sometimes uh, they're calcium carbonate, so they're white. There's a site in Pennsylvania where a lot of these uh, were taken out. You see them for sale often in their ferns, but they're in this nice white film. There's also ones that are replaced with pyrite, so they look gold and shiny, which I think is super awesome. Uh, then we have amber. 
And amber is, of course, sap from an ancient tree. I'm sure you've heard of amber before, or you've seen it in like Jurassic Park. Um, and amber is really just the sap that's fallen from the tree. It's been covered up quickly. Um, and because it's a resin, over time, it's going to undergo a process called polymerization, which is a big fancy word, which just means it's turning into plastic, basically, a really hard plastic. Um, and like this amber is 100 million years old. Amber goes back to um, a long time ago, I think around 300 million years ago, um, in small amounts. Uh, big amounts like this start in the, in the dinosaur times, and we get a ton of amber in places like uh, the Dominican Republic and Mexico which is from uh, just a few uh, dozen million years ago. And sometimes, you know, it'll preserve different little um, insects and flies and all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, it's widely available on the open market. Every now and then we get a vertebrate or something, uh, like a little lizard. Uh, you may have seen a dinosaur preserved in amber. Uh, I think it was early last year. Turns out that dinosaur was actually just a lizard, um, which was a, a mistake on the part of the scientists who described it but still super cool. Um, that's amber. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be getting any dinosaur DNA anytime soon because although it looks like you have the perfect insect in there um, and all the features are really just exactly as it, it, as it was 100 million years ago, we don't have any DNA because it's really just a carbon film um, that's in a 3D shape. So it's really just this, but in 3D, which I think is still cool. Then we have subfossils or permafrost fossils. Permafrost is a type of subfossil. And these are just fossils which are really not fossilized. There's no mineral replacement, but they've been mummified and preserved. Um, this is, uh, I believe its name is Lubia. It's a mammoth, a woolly mammoth from Siberia. Um, and it's, uh, you can see it's beautifully mummified. There's hair, there's uh, skin. I'm sure there's organs in there. Um, it's a baby, by the way. Then we have a foot from a giant bird that used to live in New Zealand called the moa. Um, and they've also found like, a, I think they found a head recently of uh, one of these um, beautiful dinosaur looking bird. Um, so that's cool, that's in our subfossil. They probably died out around 1400. No clue when exactly this one came about. And then we have trace fossils, which are not technically fossils. Uh, they're non-fossil evidence of a living creature. So instead of being, you know, uh, a remains of the body itself, um, it's remains of the lifestyle of the animal. Um, we have trackways, fortunately in Maryland, we have two, uh, we have tracks from two different periods of time. Um, and these are just footprints and ha handprints. Uh, if you go to the Natural History Society of Maryland, there are, I believe, uh, four or five tracks on a nice big slab um, that they have in the lecture room. So uh, once COVID passes, you, you can go get a look at that and it's awesome. Um, bioturbation, big fancy word, just means like if you've ever been in a pond and you've looked down, you see the algae and all the microbes have kind of made the bottom of the pond a little bit wavy and kind of weird looking. That's pretty common in, fo uh, in fossil sediments. There's also burrows. This is from the Natural History Society of Maryland, uh, one of our curators. Um, and this is from the Frederick County um, and it's a fossil from the Cambrian, which I talked about the Cambrian explosion. This is from just after that, a good 500 million years ago. And you can see this beautiful burrow coming down. These burrows are actually rather common um, in, that, in this formation. Um, and they're just for, from little worms and other invertebrates that like to make burrows. Burrows are actually one of the most common fossils uh, throughout the Maryland fossil record. Um, Worms never die, it seems, so they, they continue on no matter what happens. Um, and then we have coprolites, which everybody loves, fossilized feces, dung, poop, whatever you want to call it, um, which is awesome when we find it for scientists because it tells us exactly what those creatures were eating um, if it's preserved uh, well enough. It's kind of hard to tell when you found a coprolite because a lot of times they just look like a regular stone. Um, sometimes they're a little easier to tell. But uh, in Maryland, we definitely find coprolites. Uh, we find them mostly in more recent sediments. Um, of course, they're hard like a rock. Um, and every now and then we get something preserved in it. There was a few years ago, someone found a coprolite with a baby turtle in it. It was probably from a, a crocodile. Uh, mostly cro crocodile coprolites are what we find in Maryland. And like I said, all these things can be found elsewhere around the world, no matter where you are. Um, 
I also want to say sometimes you can see other things. Um, if you can see mud doing it or sand doing it, you can see rocks with it. So like if you've ever seen those ripples on the side of a pond or uh, the ocean or something, we find fossil ripples sometime. Sometimes if you've ever seen uh, mud after rain where it has all those raindrops in it, I found those in Maryland. It's super cool, fossilized raindrops. Just one moment in time after millions and millions and millions of years. Uh, this is me uh, being all young somewhere out in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, and you're obviously all here because you want to find your own fossils. Um, and you certainly can, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, first, you want to research your local fossil laws. You want to make sure you're not breaking any rules. Um, you're going to uh, public land has a lot of rules. So like if it's BLM uh, land, Bureau of Land Management land, uh, you probably are not allowed to collect vertebrate fossils. If it's a national park, you're definitely not allowed to take any fossils of any type. Um, but if it's on like, uh, if you're in Maryland and you're below the mean high tide line, you can collect whatever fossils you want. If you're in Virginia and you're um, below the mean low tide line, then you're good. Um, and if you're on private land, yours or someone who's given you permission, you're good. Um, and also it depends wh which state you're in, but state highway administrations in Maryland, you're allowed to collect invertebrates. Uh, elsewhere, probably different. Um, but just check with, check your laws. It's usually not that hard, just a quick internet search. Fossils are always found in sedimentary rocks because they're the sediments that got uh, laid down millions of years ago. There's also igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks. They typically don't have fossils, uh, although that's not always the case, but it's usually the case. Um, and you might think, wait a minute, how the heck do I find sedimentary rocks? Well, I'm gonna tell you now, sedimentary rocks are just shale, mudstone, limestone, sandstone. It just sounds, most of them are just the sediment with stone at the end. Um, and you will be able to find these on a geological map, which I'll talk about in a second. Outcrops like, uh, like road cuts or train cuts, uh, disused train cuts, don't go on a live track. That would be a not smart idea. Um, cliffs on the side of beaches, um, although you always want to make sure you're safe with these things because a lot of these things can fall. Sides of rivers, um, all sorts of places. Wherever stone outcrops, you can see it on Google Maps, then that's a place where you can find fossils if it's sedimentary. Um, and you'll be surprised how the sheer amount of fossil outcrops exist in the world. Um, like Western Maryland, almost every um, road cut has fossils. Um, bring tools uh, that are appropriate to what you're looking in. So let's say uh, you're at Calvert Cliffs and you're looking for shark's teeth. Um, you're gonna want waders. You might want a sifter if that's your type of thing. You like sifting rather than just scanning the beach. Um, you're probably gonna want to bring stuff, uh, always bring a first aid kit wherever you're going, um, but definitely bring alcohol if you go to the, to the bay, because there's, in the summer, sometimes the water has some bacteria in it, so if you get an open cut. Um, if you're going to Hard Rock, going out to, say, uh, uh, a road cut like this, like I'm at at this point, um, you want to bring tools. I have here a geological hammer. Uh, it's just got a nice flat end and a nice pointy end, and I also have a uh, chisel. And you're also gonna want eye protection. Uh, I took it out after this picture was taken, but um, you're gonna wanna have eye protection so you're not getting stuff in your eyes. And splitting shale can be an extremely therapeutic uh, measure. Uh, it's a very nice stress reliever, just going out there for a few hours and just splitting. And when you split all that shale, almost every time when you open up a rock, it opens up like a book and you can show light to animals which haven't seen the sun in hundreds of millions of years, which I think is a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience for anybody. I think everyone should find a fossil in their lifetime because it's just just such a great feeling. Join a local fossil club. Natural History Society of Maryland is a wonderful one. They go on tons of uh, tons of trips. Um, you can there's a few others in the Maryland area like the Calvert Marine Museum Fossil Club, uh, Maryland Geological Society. Uh, wherever you live, if you live in a state, just look up your state and then fossil club um, and a ton will come up I'm sure. Talk to your fellow fossil hunters, uh, make friends. Uh, people are super nice, um, nicer than we give them credit for, and they'll always help you if you ask, or they won't always add, help you, but most of the time they're eager to help you out uh, and find, get you some fossils. Um, 
now don't it, there's a kind of an etiquette rule in fossil hunting where you don't ask people where the really nice sites are uh, especially in like shark teeth and stuff it's kind of like fishermen in their honey holes with their fish um but uh no shame in trying to ask anyway uh learn how to identify fossils online i find the best way to learn how to identify a fossil is to just go online and look at pictures um while you're unlikely to find that exact species you'll probably find something that's related to it uh, look up the time period and the, the place where you're at um, and you'll learn how to identify fossils. Uh, and that's just so that you're not, you know, leaving a ton of fossils, something that's really cool potentially, or if not taking a million rocks back with you home. Although I'd rather um, pick up a rock than leave a fossil. So I always take important things with me or weird looking rocks back. This is the part that turns people off of fossil hunting. Don't be scared. Uh, it's how do we classify life? We always ha uh, we usually have a common name for things that are alive today, um, but unfortunately for extinct things, there was no one there to name them. So we kind of sometimes have to make up our own or sometimes we don't have one. We just call it by its species name. Um, but this system here of classifying life is really not used an incredible amount. All you really need to know is the species. This is uh, the stuff for humans. And it's really just based on features and common ancestors. I mean, we're animals. Uh, so that one's pretty easy to sort out. Uh, we have a spinal cord, so we're chordates. Uh, we produce milk and we have uh, hair, so we're mammals. We have a posable thumb, so we're a primate. We don't have a tail, so we are a great ape. Um, and we have a massive brain and we walk upright, so we're homo. And we are homo sapiens, the species. Um, this system was come up with by Carl Linnaeus, um, and he named homo sapiens back in 15, 1758. He, fun fact, his skeleton is actually this the specimen which our species is based off of. Um, but you can, when you see these big scientific names, you just gotta remember some random guy came up with that, guy or gal came up with it. Um, and it's really not that important. Don't be scared if it's a long name. Um, you can kind of cheat by cutting out the rest of this, and just putting H sapiens, just like you do with Tyrannosaurus rex, we say T-rex. Um, and once you start using these things, you're gonna, you're gonna like memorize them even if you don't want to. Um, and uh, I think it's just a good habit to start with species names, uh, but you can also resort to common names. As long as you know what you have, um, it's good. Where can you get your fossils identified if the online thing isn't working out for you? Well, you can join NHSM or a Fossil Club and its Facebook group. People are always there to help you out. Um, and any other fossil club or group will always help you out. Uh, you can join the Fossil Forum, which is a website online, which has a ton of people who are much smarter than I am, who are always there to identify every conceivable species or type or group. Um, there's experts there. They also have a Facebook group, which I'm an ad admin on. Uh, you can go to a museum or university. I put the Calvert Marine Museum uh, as an example. If you're in Maryland, they're a wonderful institution. Uh, you can go in there. They have a little fossil section. There's usually someone there and they will typically uh, be able to identify whatever fossils you found. Uh, if you have a university or university museum nearby, uh, contact their paleontologist. Email an expert. I know it's scary, but paleontologists are really nice people, especially if you're a kid. And uh, they'll, they love to share their, uh, their knowledge because, I mean, that's what they're here for. Um, the whole point of learning science is to disseminate it so that we all know the collective human knowledge, the collective of humans know uh, the, the history of life on Earth. And if you have a really obscure, weird thing and you still want to find it out yourself, uh, you can go on Google Scholar and find all the old literature you really want to take a deep dive. Um, so yeah, uh, these are definitely, I'd recommend joining the Fossil Forum and if you're in the area, the NHSM, and definitely visit the Calvert Marine Museum if you're in the area and you haven't. Now, I've been saying, throwing out things like 550 million years ago, and I know that's impossible for the human mind to even comprehend. It's hard for us to comprehend 2,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. When we start going in the millions, it's insane. Um, and no human mind can possibly count a massive amount of time that has unfolded on Earth. So we have this system here um, that helps us kind of make sense of what we see. Um, and in a perfect world, all these things are stacked right on top of each other, all pretty in a nice flat layers. This isn't always how it works out in the field, um, but I'll be telling you about a geological map next, and that can tell you where you are on this thing. Um, and this is just, you know, seeing 
Earth through the dimension of time. Um, in terms of fossils, we really only have to worry about here upwards for the most part. Um, and each time period is going to have a different group of animals, a different, uh, different faunas at different in, in land and in the ocean. And even locally, it varies a lot. Um, and there's a, a lot of research that goes on to see how is life different um, from this time to this time or from this place to this place at any random slice of time. Um, it's really a beautiful history we have on Earth. Um, fossils are known in Maryland from almost all of these time periods from Cambrian upwards. We are extremely lucky, um, except for the Jurassic. There's no Jurassic fossils in Maryland, to my knowledge. So here's a geological map of Maryland. It looks nice and pretty. It's got all these colors here. And these co colors just correspond to different time periods. Um, in a better geological map, a nicer one, uh, we have formations, which are subsets within these things. It'll, it'll tell you how old they are too. Um, and if you don't want to get like a print map, you can get one off of the, the Maryland Geological Survey. Um, you could get an app. Uh, I think it works on iPhone and Android called Rocked. It's spelled like it is on the screen. Uh, I'd highly recommend it. It tells you exactly how old the land you're standing on right now is. It's also got a neat feature where you can kind of slide back time. It'll show you what where you live or where you're standing right now looked like however far back in the future you want it to go. Um, and it also tells you whether it's a sedimentary rock or not, which is super useful. Um, so you can find fossils. Um, so I like when I'm in the car and I'm not driving, I'll just be, I'll have that on and I can see what the, uh, what age the rocks I'm in are as I'm going along the road. And if it's a nice one and I want a fossil from that period, I can be like, wait, stop the car. I want to go check out this road cut and find some fossils. Um, so now I'm just going to go through and kind of tell you uh, the common finds in Maryland for these fossils. And these kind of uh, faunas are pretty much present throughout the world for a good amount of them. Uh, I'm going to start here with the, the bottom of the Paleozoic, uh, which is the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, and the Devonian. Um, Maryland is underwater during this time period. Um, we have, I remember, um, I mentioned those crinoids, those sea lilies. Um, and crinoids and sea lilies, you know, they can be in that stalk like I showed you before. But if you're looking at them from the top, they look like these little pinwheels. A lot of them have these different pretty patterns. Um, and back in the day, these things used to form massive reefs because there's no coral yet. Um, and this, these reefs they formed were massive. And whenever a storm would come by, they're really rigid. They're, um, they're stalks. They break into a million pieces. So when you find layers like this that are full of them, you know there was a storm that went by. Um, 300 million years ago. These fossils are 542 to 359 million years old. Very old stuff. Um, this speci these specific fossils are from Maryland. I collected them. They're from the Middle Devonian, about 385 million years old. We also have these seashell looking things. Um, there's these, this species is a, or not this species, but this group of animals is still alive today. Um, they're not really seashells as you think of them. They're actually called lamp shells. Um, scientifically, they're called brachiopods. Fossil collectors call them bracts because it's nice and short. Uh, there's actually a little one that's pressed onto this big one. And you can actually, if you look closely, you can see these little seashells everywhere. Um, you can find these fossils mostly in the panhandle near Hancock and such. Then we move in to the, to the Carboniferous. That's what these two things together are called. Uh, in America, we split them because we think we're cool. So we call them Mississippi and Pennsylvania, Mississippi and Pennsylvania. Um, and then there's the Permian, which we have a little bit of in Maryland. Um, and during this time period, the earth was just covered in forests. Now, they didn't have flowering plants or fruit trees or anything like that. But what they did have was incredible amounts of ferns. And um, if you've ever been in the forest and you've seen these little tiny kind of like uh, pointy plants that are just like a cylinder, um, they're called, um, oh, no, I'm blanking on the name. Horsetails. They're called horsetails. Um, and now they're only a few inches tall, but back at this point, they were up to 100 feet tall. So this is actually a fossil I found in Maryland in the Cumberland area, I think. Um, and if you can see, it's a tree. We have a, this is part of the tree here. And then we have a little branch coming off the side. Um, and there's other little pieces of plants. This is preserved in a carbon film. Um, and you can also find really beautiful ferns and stuff. Um, Maryland has a great record. Also, West Virginia has a great Carboniferous, as does Pennsylvania. 
Um, oh, I forgot to say, there's also people love trilobites. The kind of, if you don't know what a trilobite is, if you know what a roly poly or a hill bug or an ice pod is, they kind of look like that. Um, and they, they got up to one foot, but most of them are a few inches long. They're highly sought after by collectors. Um, they're rare in Maryland, um, but you can find them in Pennsylvania and New York and um, lots of other places, depending where you live. Um, there's a site called Pendixi in Buffalo, where you can uh, pay a few bucks, I think, and you go on there and they have epic truck bin, unfortunately. But once we move from the Paleozoic, uh, we get into the Mesozoic, and people love the Mesozoic because it's the age of the dinosaurs. Um, we had stuff crawl onto land over here in the Devonian. Um, our fish, or fish evolved back here in the Cambrian. They crawled onto land in the Devonian. Um, and then we have uh, some early reptiles and early mammal-like reptiles and dinosaur ancestors evolving in this time period. Have you ever seen that giant sailed back thing called a Dimetrodon? It lives right here. We haven't found any in Maryland. They have been found in Ohio and I think that we found tracks in West Virginia. Um, once we get into Triassic, we have our first dinosaurs, which are super cool. Uh, these two are from Maryland. Um, and this is a nice little lizard track. Um, you can see there's the thumb, pointer finger, uh, uh, three other fingers over here. Uh, I have my little face thing over there, so I can't actually see it, but there's three little claw marks somewhere over there. Um, and these are from uh, the vicinity of Emmitsburg, Maryland, um, from a site that is now defunct. Unfortunately, all the sites from this time period in Maryland are defunct as far as I know. Um, but like I said, you can go to the NHSM and see some tracks, some dinosaur tracks. You can see these tracks, which are actually at Gettysburg National Battlefield. Um, they had the quarry that created the bridge at this one street. You can look up uh, Gettysburg dinosaur tracks. Um, the, the quarry had dinosaur footprints. No one really knew exactly what they were in the 1920s. I mean, there's people who knew what dinosaur tracks were, but people who were building the bridge didn't know. Um, so they just laid them on there. And there's a few across the, the bridge. Um, and here we can see there's a nice big three-toed footprint that we usually see from dinosaurs. That's a foot mark. And here we have a nice little hand mark. This species of dinosaurs had big hind legs, tiny little front legs. Um, so that is super cool. If you want to kind of have a history and paleontology day, go to Gettysburg National Battlefield. Um, we skipped the Jurassic, like I said. During the Triassic, I forgot to mention, there's volcanism uh, because we have America at, the, at this point, East Coast of America, was being pulled apart by geologic forces. We had a massive valley that went all the way up from uh, New England all the way down to North Carolina. Um, and there was ton and it created all this mud and all these dinosaurs started running around on it. And so we had dinosaur tracks from all the way in New England, all the way down to North Carolina. And we have some in Maryland, as you can see here. Um, but that volcanism also kind of uh, really picked up in the Jurassic and it kind of cooked everything. And uh, there's lava that's been inserted into things. If you find quartz, uh, like crystalline quartz, which you find a ton of in like Carroll County um, or schist, which is really just compressed shale, uh, that's from the volcanoes basically completely destroying our fossils, sadly enough. Um, the Cretaceous, Maryland picks back up again. You can go to this place. This is Dinosaur Park, Maryland in Laurel um, in Prince George's County. Um, and you can find your own dinosaur. Now you can't keep it. Um, they have a policy of uh, they keep all the vertebrate fossils, but you can keep a piece of fossilized wood when, that you find there. It's been carbonized. Uh, they call it lignite. Um, it's just wood that's left its carbon and it's just become, it's like coal, but it it's like coal in the shape of wood, basically. Um, but that's still super cool. Um, you can actually see kind of big trees of it sticking out in some places. Um, but you have a good, ch you have a fairly good chance of finding dinosaur teeth um, and, and crocodile and turtle and all sorts of things. Um, the, here are some dinosaur teeth. Uh, this was collected, actually, this one was collected by a friend of mine, Max. Um, these are Maryland state dinosaur, um, Astrodon Johnstoni or if you want to use my cheat, A. Johnston I. Um, and it was a long-necked dinosaur. If you remember from Jurassic Park, the, the first thing they see is, you know, all those long-necked dinosaurs going into the pool. Um, and they are, uh, they are called sauropods uh, in, in science speak. These specific ones are Astrodon. 
That's Maryland State Fossil. I did not say Fossil State Dinosaur. Um, they are only found in Maryland thus far. And they are, um, they're super cool. And they're called Astrodon. That means star, star tooth. If, they're, if you break off the tip, which, I mean, you don't want to, but they find them broken. They're actually star-shaped in cross-section. These are from a meat-eating dinosaur. Um, we don't have any, we have some bones from it, but we don't have a full skeleton, so no one's named the, the species or the genus, um, but it's closely related to a dinosaur called Acrocanthosaurus, big mouthful. It just means spine lizard. Um, it was about the size, a little bit smaller than T-Rex, but about the same size. Uh, had big, had not big spines coming off the back, but it had a little bit of a thinner back. Um, there was a Tyrannosaurus relative um, called Dryptosaurus. If you've ever been to DC and gone on a, uh, a road called Capitalsaurus Court, um, Capitalsaurus Court is where they found a T-Rex ancestor's uh, vertebra under it when they were doing construction. And they decided, why not just name this street Capitalsaurus Court? Because that's an awesome name. Uh, and there's tons of more other types of dinosaurs you can find here. Uh, there's raptors, uh, which are called dromaeosaurs scientifically. Um, all sorts of things that looked like this that are super cool. You can find them yourself, which I find incredibly awesome. A lot of people in Maryland are shark tooth hunters. Shark teeth are super cool. Um, and you can find your hundreds of your own if you go to this place. This place is Douglas Point and then right up north of it, uh, most people go to Hearst State Park, which is basically connected to it. Um, you can go to either or and you can find hundreds of shark teeth in an hour. Um, it's been open during the pandemic, so there's, uh, it's a little bit crowded, but it's still just the sheer volume of sand tiger shark teeth that are found there is insane. Um, there must have been a ton of sharks during that time period swimming over what is now Maryland. This is a shark tooth. This is actually found in Virginia, but it's the same formation um, by a friend, David Hoppy. Um, and this is uh, Megalodon's ancestor, Ototus obliquus. You can find this here. Um, it's a, a large shark tooth that can get up to four inches in theory. Uh, in practice, we only really get them up to two or three inches here. Um, and they're awesome. Um, collectors seek those ones out the most. There's also a serrated type of tooth there called Paleocarcharodon, which means ancient great white, even though it's not really related to the great white. kind of looks like it, even though it's small. People call it the pygmy great white. Then we have uh, what everyone wants to go to which is Calvert Cliffs. Um, and this is our state fossil, um, Ecphora gardinere, um, which is just a snail. Um, it's a sea snail. Uh, it has a very distinct color, which it retained from when it was alive. Um, it actually has the same proteins from 12 million years ago. Um, if you dissolve it in acid, they come out. Uh, and it's got these nice little ribs and everything. It's actually a predatory snail. It would eat other invertebrates. Uh, so it's kind of nice. It's a very pretty looking shell. A lot of people look for it, but it's very fragile. Um, and you can find tons of shark's teeth. Uh, this is just an example of one day. It wasn't my best day, but I did find a meg. Uh, people are always looking for a meg. Megs are the largest sharks to ever live. Um, this is a sunfish bone. If you don't know what a sunfish is, look it up because they're awesome fishes. They're the largest bony fish alive today. This is from its ancestor. He has snaggle teeth, which are really gnarly, deeply serrated teeth. Um, and th these would have gotten up to the same as a great white shark today, so about 20 feet. Um, today, their descendants are alive, but they get much smaller. Um, and then there's these, most common are these bull shark teeth, or bull shark and relative teeth, um, like Caribbean, I think Caribbean reef might be the more uh, common one. And you also find these weird striated things. Those are ray teeth. Um, this is actually the side that you wouldn't see if it opened its mouth. Uh, that's how it connects to the to the jaw. But they have these uh, big batteries which they use to crush shells because uh, that's what they do. That's what they eat. Um, and you can go to uh, Matoica. This is at Matoica. There's a little crane there. Um, Matoica Cabin's about five dollars a person. It's in Leonardstown, Maryland, and you can hunt fossils, which uh, is great. Uh, hunt, hunt shark's teeth. Um, you can also go to Calvert Cliff State Park, although I don't find much there, and Flag Ponds is another great place to go um, if you want to hunt shark's teeth. And last but not least, we have the Pleistocene, the Ice Age, as we like to call it, um, as the public. And uh, they're kind of really thinly and widely spread out throughout the United States. There's no real specific formation you can go to, 
Um, but we are super lucky in Maryland. We have a few, a select few caves um, that have preserved a lot of um, fossil mammals from that time period. Uh, this is from a cave called the Cumberland Bone Cave, which they excavated the late 1800s and also the early 1900s and the 1950s. And thousands of bones of different mammals came out of there. This is a um, black bear or the, or the ancestor to it. There's debate over whether it's a different species or not. Um, maybe you've heard of dire wolves, the giant scary wolves of the past. Well, we find their ancestor, their larger and scarier granddaddy, Ambruster's wolf or Armbruster's wolf. Um, so that's super cool. We also have saber teeth. We have mammoth, we have mastodon, which is kind of like a mammoth, um, just it lives in the forest instead of on the plain. Um, we have a larger species, slightly larger species of turkey, which we know from, uh, uh, from Stratford Hall, which Natural History Society of Maryland has a trip to. Um, every, you mostly find these types of teeth there, um, but every now and then they'll find a footprint from, uh, from an ice age animal. They found a, a new type of turkey, they found um, mammoth footprints. They found like amphibian and crocodile footprints, which is super cool. Uh, you don't think of during the ice age as warm in Maryland, but um, the ice age is really a fluctuation of temperatures. So sometimes it's really hot, sometimes it's really cold. Um, so yeah, and that's that. Uh, as you can see, we have a really diverse history in Maryland that goes all the way uh, from back all the way forward. Um, and just to just show this real quick, uh, just so I can put this all in context in your mind if you live in Maryland. This is where we're going to be finding those younger fossils of the shark's teeth mostly. This is Dinosaur Alley right here is what they call it, uh, where all the dinosaur stuff is found. Not much right here, unfortunately. Um, that's all been cooked by that uh, Triassic. But then we have uh, this right here. No, that's also cooked, but right here. Uh, you can see Frederick is here. Frederick is right about here. And it sits on the border of dinosaur footprint bearing um, stuff from the Triassic, uh, if you remember the footprints I showed you. And right here from the Cambrian where life first evolved, there's tiny trilobites known from there. Uh, there's the, the burrows and stuff. This is more of that. Um, and then here we have, if you remember the shells and the crinoids, that's mostly in this area. And then from here, from over here, uh, where all the coal mines are, that's all the all the ferns and stuff, and also dotted throughout, of course, is the, the Ice Age caves. Um, so that's just a quick overview of stuff in Maryland. I know I just threw a lot of stuff at you, um, but I think we have time for questions, hopefully. And if you have any extra questions I don't get to get to, you can email me or uh, follow my page or just email Bronwyn or the Natural History Society of Maryland, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Um, or I'll direct it to someone who can. Um, and these are the people who contributed. The Smithsonian helped a lot. Uh, George Spica, Dave Hoppe, uh, the Maryland Geological Survey, and all HSM staff. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions, um, if we can. Yeah, thank, sorry. Thank you, Mason, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I, I put one on there because you showed how, you know, Maryland is often um, touted as America in miniature. Is it also fossil in miniature in terms of the fossil record compared to other states um, in terms of what you can find here as you go from the east to the west? We actually, we definitely have, I have not found a state in America yet which has as epic a record as we do. Uh, showing all of the different time periods, having fossils from all these different faunas and environments and stuff. It feels like we're, we live in a zoo in stone. Um, so we are America in miniature, and we're also the entirety of Earth's history in miniature, which I think is pretty cool. It looks like there's a question. Um, read the mineral film fossils. What allotrope of carbon do the films consist of? Amorphous Oof. or graphite? Chemistry. Chemistry yeah. problem. Um, I would assume uh, whatever coal is made out of, it's the same. I would assume that's graphite. Um, so yeah, probably that. Uh, I think it can differ though. And you got to remember, they're not really just one mineral. Um, we can think of it that way, but they're really a mix of things. A lot of times we get different colors because we have staining of different um, 
uh, different metals. Um, and you got to remember all these minerals are only things that are in groundwater or in the animal itself. Uh, so iron is something we see in living things. So we'll see a lot of iron colors associated with iron, like red and yellow. Um, we'll see black from coal or uh, purple from manganese or gold from pyrite. So that's my answer. I don't know if that Jocelyn is. seems pretty sad. There's no sites in Northeast in like Cecil County. Uh, I have to go look at the thing. Uh, I th yeah, uh, well, no, you're, there's actually, there's something over here called the uh, CND Canal. You've probably heard of it if you live in the area. Um, while it's not super fossiliferous anymore, um, because people have picked it over, unfortunately, it had some Cretaceous fossils, because you can see this green stuff over here. That's dinosaur stuff. Um, so they had uh, some marine stuff there uh, from the same time period as the dinosaurs, just underwater. Um, and they used to find some shark's teeth. Uh, they have, there's a giant sea reptile called Mosasaurus. If you've watched Jurassic, War, uh, Jurassic World, you've seen Mosasaurus. Um, you can find them there. Uh, they have a lot of these. There used to be a type of squid. Squids today still have this, like, they call it a pen. It's just a kind of cylinder inside them. Back in the day, that was hard and mineralized. You can find a lot of those. And if you live on the eastern shore, don't, don't despair quite yet, because on Assateague Island here, um, every now and then, some fossils wash up from uh, from the, the little bit offshore, and you can find fossil crabs and shark's teeth sometimes. You can also find shark's teeth on this side. Um, it's rare, but you can. Um, Shelley wants to know about the limestone quarries in Woodsboro. Were there any fossils ever found there? Do you know of? Uh, where exactly? <laughs> where exactly is Woodsboro? That's not in my in my geography knowledge, unfortunately. Um, it's not mine either. I'm not sure. I can't pinpoint that either. Uh, if that's most limestone quarries. It says it's Frederick County. Yeah, most limestone quarries are Frederick County um, in this area here. Uh, from the top of Frederick through Monoxy Battlefield all the way down to, I think that's Point of Rocks down there. Um, but yeah, this little thing, it does have the limestone. You can fossil hunt in it. Unfortunately, because it's from like the beginning of life on, on uh, Earth, or, or the beginning of multicellular life, it's kind of sparse. Um, I have yet to find any fossils in it. I know someone who found a beautiful trilobite in it. I used to, I, I remember I had a substitute teacher once in like elementary school whose like uncle like owned one of the quarries and he said he used to find trilobites all the time in it. Um, so I'd say probably. We have a question. Um, what is, you know, being a, a, a an expert shark tooth hunter as you are. What's your suggested technique? Is it in the water or on shore? So, or do you have any other tips? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I want to, I may have forgot to point out this. Uh, you definitely want to be careful when you're at the cliffs because those, the, the cliffs can fall down without notice. Um, so if you're a, a child, you might want to be there with an adult. Um, and, you know, just, just be mindful. Don't go right after a rain or something. Uh, in terms of fossil hunting, there's no right or wrong way to do it with shark's teeth. Um, the best advice I can give is go two hours before high tide or low tide, hunt all the way to low tide, and then the two hours afterwards, mm. because that's when new fossils are going to be exposed. Um, you can definitely sift, and there's some sites that are super productive sifting. Um, I am not that patient, unfortunately. So... Uh, I like to run all the way up and down uh, the cliffs, looking for teeth along the shoreline, um, along the, uh, there's a process called winnowing, which leaves uh, things of different density at different levels. So if you see like a line of large rocks, uh, it's nice to go up, up looking at that to see if there's a larger, hopefully denser megalodon tooth or something there. Um, so that would be my personal method, but it's not any better than any other method. I would I would assume that it a practice makes um, perfect in terms of that since you're you're putting a, a your, your specific camera eyes on it and at various oh, yeah. times. So yeah, there's something called a search image, which is basically having that image in your mind of what you're looking for. Um, and so, like I've had certain days where I can only find one species of shark for some reason, and I just find like 50 just random snaggle teeth. Um, just get in your mind what you're looking for, and you will find it because they are there. Lance wants to know, um, 
about fossil bone and teeth that aren't completely replaced by mineral content? Is there, a, is there a percentage split between mineral and original animal material? Yes, um, certainly. And the thing is, it's not an exact science. Uh, there's, it depends how old the rock, rock is. I'll give you an example. When I, I, one of the first things I brought to Calvert Marine Museum, I was so excited. I found mammal teeth um, at Brownies Beach, which at the time was open and good for fossil hunting. Um, and they were, they were hard and, and dense like rock, um, and you could feel them, um, you feel that they were denser uh, and heavier. So I brought them to Calvert Museum, I was super excited, uh, and they were excited too because it's rare to find terrestrial mammals in a ocean deposit, uh, as you might think, because they have to float out there. Um, and they went, and they, there's a test called the burn test. Uh, it's harder on teeth, but you just do it with the root um, or you do it with bone where you uh, hold a flame to it. And if it's modern, it'll have collagen in it. So it'll smell like burnt hair when you burn it. Uh, if it's fossil, you won't smell anything. They did that and they smelled it. They smelled burnt hair, which means that those mammal teeth, though they were partially mineralized, were probably only a few hundred or, or anywhere between one year old and 1000 years old. So things, depending on the mineral content, can mineralize super quickly. In other cases, you can have bone that has the same original material in it. They did isotopic dating on some dinosaur bone in uh, Morocco, and it had the original isotopes. And you know that's 100 million years old, that specific bone. So it really just depends where you are. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a percentage thing. Um, and uh, Tom, thanks for mentioning that. We were planning on having a collecting course before the COVID. Uh, again, keep, keep connected to the Natural History Society of Maryland because again, after, after the pandemic is over, um, we'll be able to do a lot more things in person. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, we have somebody who wants to know if there's any good location, if you're willing to share, <laughs> if you're willing to share, Mason, do you know of any good locations in Harford County, Harford County to uh, hunt for fossils? Yeah, I don't personally know of any. Um, the problem with Harford County is that it's, it can be kind of flat and it's also kind of urbanized. So it's hard to find exposures, um, places where the, you know, it's cut open. In that area, we've had, uh, when the glaciers retreated back in the, at the end of the ice age, all the water that came down left a bunch of new stuff on top of everything. Um, we're fortunate down in Southern Maryland that a lot of that's been eroded off. The case is not so same for the Northern, North, that kind of North of the Bay and, and East. You, I would suggest looking closer to the bay, you'd have to dive into the literature, I'm sorry to say, um, but you could probably find some marine Cretaceous sites. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure exactly what you'd find. You're, you're not a long drive from Calvert Cliffs there, um, so might as well make the trip down and find some shark's teeth, in my opinion. All right, and the Fossil Club does have some uh, trips that are coming up. Unfortunately, they're all filled up. They fill up really quickly. So when you see them advertised, I um, definitely suggest that you get on and register as quickly as possible. I know that they're gonna have some uh, more trips coming up very soon. And um, again, if you're not in the club I, uh, and you're interested in fossils, I suggest that you do get involved with the fossil club. Um, let's see. That lottery also, by the way, that's like an invaluable prize, getting that lottery and be able to go out to a, to a private beach where not many people go, you're gonna find a ton of awesome shark's teeth and you're there with great experts, so. And you might wanna invite Mason to go along with you. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um, and Roslyn also asks, uh, what are your favorite fossils to hunt? Ooh, well, I'm the Humpson, so I'm, I'm a high school senior. I'm just going to put that out there, mea culpa. Um, but I am, uh, uh, my career that I want to go into is human origins. 
So um, I like to study, I think the, the human story is the most incredible story. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that in Maryland. So I do a lot of shark's tooth hunting. Um, the kind of white whale I'm always wanting to find is a giant serrated thresher, uh, which is just, a, we have threshers alive today, but these things were like bigger than great whites and they were serrated and oh, super cool. I want to find one of those. Um, but yeah, every time period kind of has a cool fossil that I want to find. Uh, and if you get into fossil hunting, all of these things, some people are, they like have their niche. Some people just want to find megs or just want to find trilobites. But um, I find that there's something cool in every time period. I'm not sure that answers it, but that's my question. I think that does. Yeah. All right, well, on uh, uh, thank you on behalf of the Natural History Society of Maryland and everybody here. Thank you, Mason, for sharing your passion and your expertise with us. Um, this was wonderful. It makes me want to go out and <laughs> just dig, dig around and hopefully find Do some uh, fossils. Yeah, I'll dig. Thank you so much. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about it. Yeah. And we hope that we will see you all soon at another presentation from the, uh, the Natural History Society of Maryland. Um, thank you again. If the person who asked about the recording is still there, you can send me an email and hopefully Bronwyn will give me the link and I'll get you the recording. Yep, if you got on late, uh, yeah, email bstrong at marylandnature.org and um, I'll be able to send you the recording. Mason, can you hear me? Yeah. I lost everything, Every, like your presentation everything. I don't know where it is it, on my screen. Um, but that place where you were a kid, you were standing there with the fossil and the, the you know, the, um, yeah. where were you? What were you looking for? I was at Red Hill, Pennsylvania, um, which is, you have to, right now it's kind of in limbo because the, the state put in a rule where he, you couldn't dig in the outcrop. But at that point you could, if you just had the curator of the, of the little kind of tiny museum they have there. Um, and I sent him an email and he was like, sure, let's do it. Uh, and what's cool about that site, it's from exactly when fish kind of crawled onto land and became, uh, you know, four-legged animals. Um, of course, I didn't find any, but it's, it's, a, it's a river deposit from 300 million years ago. You can find armored fish, which I find mm -hmm. super cool. I found a, or I helped excavate, I didn't find it, but a, a cheekbone from a giant predatory um, lobe fin which is wow. like 19 foot fish with gnarly two inch teeth. Uh, so that's where I was there. Hopefully that place will open back up and we can get back there soon. I know My friend lives up there. Yeah, it's in Heiner, Pennsylvania. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of out in the woods, but uh, definitely worth it if anyone, it's one of my, it's probably the coolest place I've ever fossil on to, to be 100% honest. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. I'm, you, you are quite encyclopedic in your knowledge. Blows me away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I love, I just like, I like, I find it all so interesting. Well, you're, you definitely, it, it shows. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to find your passion so early in life. Yeah, really definitely. Is. I hear, is that you, Brownwin? It is, yes. I have no idea what happened to my screen. Good grief. This is so weird. Me and technology. Anyway, uh, good night, everybody. I'll good night, Michelle. Take care. Take care. Everybody's logging off. Yeah, I'm just, I am just. was going to wait till everyone logged off so I'd say bye to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I know. Of course, I can't log off because I don't know where anything is. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. I just totally lost everything. I think you were on twice. Was I on twice? Yeah. But what? Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, this is so bizarre. Well, you'll just have to keep talking and hey, you close the program and leave me. <laughs> I don't know where anything is. Let's see. Lyndon says, thanks for the shout out to Penn Dixie. Buffalo is my hometown and I love those Devonian cliffs. 
Ooh. Yes, I want to go there so bad. I think the NHSM was going to have a trip there. I think it got canceled, unfortunately, but uh, it's yeah. an awesome place. I want to go there. The one with Tom? Was Tom yeah. going on? Yeah. This is Adrian. Tom Farrell uh, tries to run a trip there uh, on what they call the experts dig, where they, they bring in heavy equipment and move a lot of rocks out of the way. But it's, it's a crazy place. It's like a couple football fields wow. uh, full of gravel, uh, almost. Maybe Lyndon should uh, uh, to host a, a trip up there, if you're up there. Okay. Um, but it, it's a cool spot. Uh, Mason, you did a fantastic job, as usual. Thank you so uh, much, Adrian. Incredible, sir. Thank you. So, it. Real, really nice. Yes. Uh, Lyndon better ask her parents first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a lot of cool, there's a lot of cool Devonian places. I could spend a long time talking about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, uh, make friends with Tom Farrell. He tries to do that uh, regardless. Um, it's one of his favorite trips. He, he, there's a couple spots uh, basically along the way that he tries to go to um so he was on tonight very yeah. good mm -hmm. um and, like to hear. you got <laughs> and we've got uh there's a guy named trent um i can't remember his last name who's in the fossil club and um we basically try to organize a trip around trent's schedule out into the Western Maryland, Cumberland area, uh, stretches into West Virginia, um, around Laval, Maryland, and they pull back uh, tentaculites and things like that. Ooh, those are super cool. Yeah. Little cone-shaped fossils. We know right. no clue what they're related to, but they're awesome. Right, right. Um, and and it's it's like shark's teeth, you know, it's yeah, you got one, but so what? You want to get another one? They're not conodonts. Conodonts are uh, are little. They're not really even teeth. They kind of evolved separately from teeth, but they work like teeth from little kind of eel-like things that don't have backbones. Um, tentaculites are they're a shell basically, but they're kind of a little cone-shaped shell. They're very strange. They're a very strange group of creatures. And um, I, I think of conodonts as microscopic and. Tentaculitis are absolutely visible to uh, to the eye. Yeah, you can find a ton of them in Maryland in our. Should, we, should we do a presentation on them? Sure. <laughs> there is, uh, and and we should maybe even consider a joint presentation. I think there's someone in the fossil club who is uh, fascinated by conodonts. I think her name is Diane Winter. Okay. I know a, a, a scientist on those down at USGS. I'm sure he'd love to speak. Well, dude, we are uh, looking for speakers because otherwise you got to do every talk that uh, on, on every day. <laughs> I know. I've, I just, I went back. I just created like five just in case. Like there's just a, a time where we're like, we can't find anybody. Right. <laughs> a new thing. We need a speaker for uh, November to advertise in the October for the uh, Club of Palooza event. So. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if you would like to give another one in October and, and, uh, not the October, October, you're doing uh, in November. Months. Thank you. I have a uh, one talk that I'm excited about that's Native American use of shark teeth. Yeah. That one is cool. So, uh, cool. uh, for that one, I want to get together with you. Uh, yeah. I just got another one from Mark Bennett. Ah, uh, ah, uh, and, uh, it's it's worthy of a, a picture and a description yes. and and I've uh, worked with uh, uh, Jason Schellenhammer mm -hmm. to get several of our things put into the three D images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to figure out how to put that in a PowerPoint. Well, we can just give you the photos. Yeah. People can upload the images mm -hmm. if they wanted to. 
but but let's get together and uh, and figure that one out. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Bronwyn, thanks for letting us keep you up late at night. Thank you so much for your help, Bronwyn. You're a super person. Oh, Mason, thanks so much. And um, uh, we need to go out on a on a trip together. All yeah, right. Hey, Mason, did you make it into the uh, uh, strategy?